Boston Redevelopment Authority. We're here for the first official meeting under BRA Article 80 Large Project Review of the Lewis Wharf Proposal. I want to acknowledge the my colleagues in government, Maria Lanza from Mayor Walsh's Office of Neighborhood Services is with us, Karen Carangelo from the City Council of Salamatese, Salamatese, sorry, I didn't Kathy, I'm sorry. Patrick Lyons from Rub Aaron Mike's office is here with us. And Maria Popolo is here from Senator Petroselli's office. So we thank them for their partnership in this project. This is the first official impact advisory group meeting for the proposal before us at the Lewis Wharf on the North End of Waterfront. This project seeks approval from the Boston Redevelopment Authority for Article 80 total gross square footage is greater than 50,000 square feet, triggering Article 80 review of the Boston Redevelopment Authority. A project notification form, which we call PNF, was submitted to the VRA on September 15th, setting off the 30-day public comment period required under Article 80. As part of the process, we've assembled an impact advisory group with the help of our local elected officials. How the impact advisory group is assembled is local elected officials nominate um, members of the community. They could be local residents, stakeholders, business owners, or active citizens. And the BRA um, chooses which individuals to place on it. We have a full impact advisory group roster of 15 individuals from the North Bend. And we look forward to continue working with them. The impact advisory group role is to help the BRA officials determine the impacts, mitigation, ultimately whether or not to approve the project or not. Uh, the public is also critical in this process. But the Impact Advisory Group is why we're here tonight. These folks uh, serve in an advisory role to the city and to the VRA, so they will have precedent to speak tonight, as we've done in past meetings, and I'll speak to more to that in a moment. Uh, I'm going to repeat a couple things, and I'm going to touch on a couple new things before I hand it over. So first off, I want to once again say that the Boston Redevelopment Authority is not showing you this proposal tonight with a ringing endorsement or telling you that it's set in stone. It is currently under review. And we have told the proponent that they can submit and go through the process. That is all we have told them. They need the approval of our board, obviously. This process vets the project. In that vetting process, we determine whether or not we think it's appropriate to bring forward to our board or not. Multiple factors go into that determination, including how meetings like this go, how the public comments received, uh, feel about the process, and we work with our elected officials to see how they feel about the project as well. I want to reiterate uh, something that is that, that, that maybe uh, I may have a bit of confusion by some folks out there. The entire project is under review at this time. That includes urban design, zoning conformity, and the legality are all still being vetted and analyzed by the Boston Redevelopment Authority. We have not made a final determination on, on any of those moving parts. It is still under a thorough review by BRA staff, legal staff, and our front office, and we continue to work with our local elected officials. So once again, tonight's meeting is going to flow like IAG gets the first opportunity to speak. Any questions or comments they have to the VRA, to the proponents, they're going to get the opportunity to do. At the end, if there is time left over until 9 o'clock, we will open it up to the public. Um, I, I really want to hammer home and ask you, with all due respect, to please respect the process. The past couple meetings, we have had some folks who have, um, who, have, who, have, who have yelled out a turn and who have disrupted the process when we're trying to have a conversation between the IAG and the proponent. Quite frankly, it's, it's not, it doesn't really help your cause. It doesn't help the dialogue of the conversation, and it really hasn't helped the productivity of the process. So please ask again and respect the process. Even if you don't love the process, we will, you will have ample time to speak. Um, to this point, we received well over 200 public comments. Obviously, this is high. Uh, we know how important this is to the North End and the North End waterfront, so we're not surprised by that. We expect quite a bit more comments to come in, obviously, after this meeting and the next. We, we accept and we look forward to hearing any questions or comments you have. Nothing is off the table. If you feel that something wasn't addressed in the PNF, you have every right to question that to the VRA and ask for clarity on it. So we continue to, to receive your comments. We read every one. We share every one with senior staff, so please keep them coming. Uh, as far as next steps go, we will be back here on October 7th next week. We will be 
be up in the gymnasium, we expect a better, a bigger crowd, and we, we expect to do the format a little differently. That will be a completely public meeting, open to anyone who wishes to speak. Uh, we're working on getting some microphones and, and having a receiving line to, to make it more of a public feel, and everyone will get equal opportunity to speak at that meeting. The comment period currently extends on October 15th, so please keep that in mind. VRA is going to see how this meeting goes, see how the 7th goes, continue to monitor the comments that come in for the 15th, continue to look through the legal documents with our staff, and then determine next steps in the process. And of course, we'll be in touch with you all. May I ask that you please sign in a leave your email address. Um, I, we, we have a great email chain of almost 300 folks so far, so we'd love to add to you, love to add you to that if you're not already on that. So please sign in tonight, add to the email chain. We try to be as uh, thorough as possible with communication, keep you updated on every step going forward. So in respect to the IAG conversation tonight, and I'm speaking to the IAG members here, I know that some of you may have uh, speeches you're prepared to give, and that's okay. Whatever you've come with on your mind, we want to hear. Whatever questions are on your mind, we want to hear. We do hope, if, if you have a specific ask of the proponent of the VRA, if it's in regards to traffic, Parking, resident permit parking, or a mitigation piece. This is an appropriate time to start that conversation. So feel free to get those off your chest if you have a specific request, because we've heard some, some complaints on traffic, but if you, if you have a specific request to hit on, tonight is absolutely the time you can, you can get the ball rolling and start the discussion on that. Okay? So I think that's it for me. I'm going to hand it over to the attorney, Daniel Toscano, ask him to introduce the team, and I'm going to ask Will Adams to really run through the slides because most, quite frankly most people have seen all the slides so we're going to ask them to really run through it and then we hope to get a lot of dialogue, a lot of back and forth out of this session today. Daniel? Chris, thank you. Uh, IAG members, uh, thank you for being here. Once again, my name is Daniel Toscan. I'm a local attorney working for the developer uh, JW Capital Partners. I want to uh, welcome everybody here tonight. Uh, in particular, I want to thank again the IAG members for their participation, uh, participation in this uh, process. Uh, thank you. I think what uh, Chris and, not to reiterate what Chris had said. We're going to go through the slides. I know uh, most of us, uh, most of the IAG members, have seen the entire proposal. So we're going to shorten the proposal a little bit tonight through some of the slides. We're going to try and address some of the concerns that we heard over the last couple of meetings um, and through like the BRA and the comic period. Address some of those concerns and certainly answer any new questions that you have. But I want to introduce the team. I think uh, everybody has met uh, Will Adams from JW Capital Partners. Uh, we have PJ Moriarty from uh, JW Capital, our zoning attorney at Juan Weiss. We have our uh, uh, transportation analyst, Liz Perk. We have uh, J.D. Clancy, our architect. So with that said, uh, we'll, I'll turn it over to Will. We'll go through the slides. Uh, and we'll, we'll try to address uh, your concerns and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, hi, my name is Will Adams. We just walked through slides very quickly. I know we're trying to get the answers right away or questions right away. Um, so some of these slides you've all seen before. Um, so we just wanted to reintroduce um, the project. Again, I'm going to be capital partners with Will Adams. Uh, existing conditions, we all know it's a surface parking lot in the dilapidated filing fields. Uh, existing conditions, pictures of the surface parking lot. Uh, existing conditions, pictures of both the surface parking lot and the filing fields. Existing conditions, aerial view. Uh, this is, again, a recap of the previously approved project. It was previously approved uh, in 1991 for a 335 key Marriott Hotel along with 570 subterranean parking spaces, fully approved at both the BRA and uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, our project is a 277-key hotel, 190,000 gross square feet, 379 subterranean parking spaces. Our intent is to maintain the existing 223 public spaces. We do not want to remove those out of circulation. Uh, and add the required amount of parking for the hotel, another 156 spaces. We're creating two, almost 2.4 acres of pedestrian open accessible space, 1.25 acres of adjacent waterfront parking space. Uh, we are fully compliant with Article 42A in our estimation, as well as with Chapter 91. We will address uh, later when we get to the Q&A, but this is comments about Article 25. Um, our belief is we're still fully compliant with uh, zoning. 
This is the landscape plan that you've all seen in the past. A rendering of the hotel looking east. Rendering of the hotel looking west. Uh, and this is the various heights of all the uh, surrounding buildings. And with that, we're going to turn it over to the IG. Thanks. And I do want to reiterate, we understand the proponent believes that the zoning is as of right and all the regulations are as of right and within conformity. As I said at the beginning, that is still under review with the VR. Okay. So at this point, we'll open it up to the IAG. We'll just go by a show of hands, whoever's ready. Ernest. Thank you. Um, I, I have a number of questions, and it would be helpful if we had the uh, landscape plan slide up. Um, and uh, or maybe we we'll start with the existing conditions plan. Uh, I wish I could borrow your uh, yeah. laser. You want to drive it? I've never, no, <laughs> just the laser. I don't know oh. how I use that. Parts in the middle. Oh, the middle button. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Uh, so I can get back here then. Excuse me. So um, let's see. So this is the, the swimming pool currently, and your plan contemplates that the new construction will cover this whole area here. The swimming pool will move back here, and so my question is just how much uh, green space will be lost by that construction plan. Mm -hmm. so. Very, uh, it's a good question, Ernie. Actually, as we speak today, the site currently has, and Gabe, you're going to have to correct me on the statistics, but I believe we have about 19,000 square feet of green space today. I'm just conditions. about on this side. Right, well, we're going to have 34,000 square feet of green space entirely when the project is complete. So on that side there, I'm not aware, I do not know that exact amount of green space. Okay, ne next question is on on the, I guess it's the north side, um, here. There is a narrow sidewalk along the building now and then uh, cars parked here. Mm -hmm. uh, your roadway will be coming in this way. How much green space will there be between that narrow sidewalk and the roadway? There's, it's really what it is, is it's a tree-lined um, brick sidewalk with parallel parking spaces. You can kind of see it on the plan to the left that's on the board there. Well, I think specifically that how much space will be, why don't we then take it from the wall of the historic Lewis Wharf building? How much space will there be between the wall of the historic Lewis Wharf building and the roadway. How many feet of space? Um, it's a, uh, like a seven foot parallel parking lane and then uh, like a seven foot sidewalk. And so just a seven line. foot sidewalk. Well, um, well, it's 14 feet. So it, there'll be 14 feet between the wall of the historic building and the roadway. Is that what you're saying? Well, there's there's a the property line I think extends about seven feet from the building, so we're not really doing anything within that. Right. So that's the what I refer to as the sidewalk. Okay. So then, how much space will there be, say, between the sidewalk and your roadway? Right. So then, I think we're going another seven out, and plus the parallel parking spaces. We're all fitting within that twenty-seven foot uh, uh, vehicular easement that's running along. We can do an exact diagram for you that maps out maybe, exactly. Maybe you can go section. to the next, uh, you know, the new condition slide thing. You have oh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you mean the <laughs> landscape <laughs> plan? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And then I can take that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, yeah. You, you, you contemplate parallel parking Correct. along yes. here? Correct. Along the road. Yeah. Yes. Parallel parking? Oh. Yes. And who gets to park there? Right now it's public parking. We haven't figured well, that I mean, out yet. This, this is in the, in the, the new space. Correct. Public parking. Yeah. So there will be public parking, probably zip cars and stuff like that? It's not. That's not yet been determined. 
where will the uh, the kiosk or whatever you call it uh, for access public parkers be? If this is going to be public parking, then there'll be, I assume, a kiosk out here. No, it'll be it'll be a, a typical garage that you pull into in the city. So it will so, not be a surface kiosk. So, okay, so we still don't know how these guys get to park here. Right now, it's, it's indeterminate. So, this building here, mm -hmm. uh, just how big is it? And why is it necessary? Why can't the sailing center be located in some of the vacant uh, retail space here in the historic building, the sailing center offices? Well, we don't own or control any of that space in that little store. But you can lease it. We, we could, but we'll and, uh, and in fact, in fact, one of your early presentations a year ago, didn't you say that? Uh, I think it was Mr. Moriarty Sr. said that your contract with the owner <coughs> contemplated that if you get this permitted and do the construction, that you will then buy out all of his interests. It's not, in we're not including the, um, the, the space within the granite building. Oh, yeah. yeah. He did say that, didn't he? Okay. Well, that was maybe about a year ago. Well, can I speak to the pavilion just yeah. a little bit? Um, so, you know, that was sized, when you think about it, when you're gathering the buildings that are marching down, um, the intent of that building, in addition to providing kind of a storefront face for the sailing center, whose, you know, main location is really underwater, we wanted to give them kind of retail presence on Atlantic um, as a way to kind of help them lure people down at the waterfront. But it was also the thought of a continuation of this urban kind of street wall. So you have buildings marching down Atlantic, the Wharf buildings, Lewis, Pilot House. And this is, in a sense, a continuation of that. And it was also meant to kind of cap or to kind of end the park, to give a little separation between Atlantic and interior park space. So the building kind of acts as a, as a liner or a, a way to mediate between what is an urban street and what will be a waterfront park. So there's a combination of elements that that pavilion was trying to do. Obviously, the size is something that can kind of, you know, move to some degree. But the urban intent was to reinforce the street wall, to give some kind of separation between the park and Atlantic Avenue, and to it's provide that. It's interesting that you say street wall because that's exactly what it does. It builds a street wall, and I think certainly my concern is that this is just a further way to block. Uh, the invitation of the waterfront to the pedestrians walking on the street. I think that's entirely, you know, I went through all of this through multiple MGH developments, and we cooperated with the BRA in building a street wall on Cambridge Street, and it seems very appropriate there where we're not blocking views of the harbor, but here I question the reasonableness <coughs> of this. Uh, and it, if I can, Ernie, just to answer, the size of that building is about 2,700 square feet on two floors. Correct. About 50 so it's about 1,500. I, I realize that. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I have a dozen more yeah. questions. I'll ask just one more. Oh, uh, we're, we're, well, we're I want to give my colleagues <laughs> on the IAG a chance. Um, I'm all in favor, by the way, as I've told you many times, of development of this area. Uh, I, I just want to see appropriate development. To my subjective opinion, it's appropriate development. Um, in all of the traffic uh, uh, studies, which, uh, as I've told you before, I don't find at all credible, have you taken into account the amount of traffic that would be caused by the 130 uh, uh, boat slips here. The, the summer traffic is usually the worst, mm -hmm. and that's when. And and by the way, I, while well, I appreciate boat taxis, water taxis, uh, I think would be great. Would you allow any other uh, boats for hire uh, other than the sailing center? I mean, would you allow any other boats for hire? I mean, yeah, we haven't really delved into that, but yeah, I think the idea here in the in the water court terrace is that <clears throat> this is even a touch and go dock short term tie up. You know, someone comes across from Charlestown or uh, 
seaport and they each day they want to tie up for a half an hour, 45 minutes, that's the intent of that area. I'm, I'm actually talking yeah. about rental boats or excursion boats <coughs> or stuff like that. Would they be taboo <coughs> or would they be allowed? We're open to discussing that, whether you want it or don't want it, that's part of this process. No, I I'm, I'm, I'm just definitely afraid of the traffic. That's my big thing. And I'll let Liz answer whether we look at <coughs> Marina. Yes. yes. Um, so Marina is one of the land uses that we considered in our preliminary traffic study. And there's a more detailed traffic study to come as part of the process. But that is one of the land uses that we considered. And so, yes, it is in the process. Can I ask a because I also found in this PNF the traffic analysis to be quite lacking. So I, what is the timeline for actually getting what you guys think is credible traffic analysis for us to review? Because it clearly is the most important issue that, at least for me, is the most important concern with this project. And I still, every time I keep reading something, I'm getting nothing on the traffic. So. Um, so this, the report that's been submitted is the PNF, the project notification form that Chris talked about. That is where we present a very cursory analysis, um, I won't even say analysis, a cursory presentation of traffic conditions. Um, and the last time around I had the slide of like the transit services and the number of new trips that will be generated. But that detailed, what we call intersection level of service analysis, that comes in the next phase. So it's not unusual in a pure PNF, which this is, to not have that information. I truly appreciate that you all are very hungry to you know, look at it, and we're anxious to do the analysis. It's just part of the natural progression of things. Yeah, and, and again, like, like I put it out at the beginning, now that we're under the official article aid review, if you feel that something hasn't been articulated in the PNF that should be, we'd like to hear specifically what it is so we can do that. Yeah. I think I know where you're at. Your biggest concern is that that's part of the scoping session that we go through, too. Yeah, but if, if, if we determine <coughs> that, that more analysis is needed, right. obviously, then we'll yeah. go into that. Could, could you, before we move on, I'm sorry, could you just give us a little more flavor of what you're looking for but not seeing, just to help us? I can do that. Okay, yeah. that's good. Right. I'm, I'm asking right. you. Yeah. I, so I read it pretty closely, and just the traffic study that you're saying you want more well, I just responded to her specific comment that she felt like when she read it, it was, it was thinner than she was expecting. I, 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 I'm eager to hear your thoughts too. Okay, okay, no, sure. I, I, can, I get because she, I, she had I think a, we are all on the same page around this, um, and I don't mean to speak for people, but anyone who read this PNF would have felt like there's something lacking when it comes to traffic. So let's go to that section that is around the traffic and talk through it. Especially given that a lot of people may not have read it as clearly as we had the chance to. Okay. Is everyone on it? So it's uh, 3-11. 3-11. That's the start. Okay. Uh, so for me, the first thing when I was looking at this is I wanted some better analysis of uh, how much would how much the hotel with the restaurant and all of the amenities and would impact traffic? And I understand. I am not going to remember your name. I'm so Liz. sorry, Liz. Liz. I understand Liz that you shared some basic data with us, and I was looking for more information around that so I could understand more of the analysis behind it because I felt like that data wasn't capturing what I see and experience regularly in the North End now, let alone with such a huge project that you guys are proposing. So I was hoping to get into that a lot more to understand how you guys were deriving some of this new um, ridership um, information that just felt to me really off. So and just I, just to make sure we're getting the message. So what you're saying is there's a hotel, but there are other elements of this project too. Lots of and other you see elements. them adding up. 
And you want yes. to understand how they add up together yes. and impact traffic. That is, that is very important. Okay. And I'd like to understand, because there was a lot of wonderful maps that showed existing traffic patterns. And you'll notice, if you're looking at figure 3.6 or 3.7, I mean, there's some pretty significant traffic headed towards 93 and Storo on either side of um, Atlantic Cross Street, that area. I want to understand how this project is going to impact that traffic because that's deadlock on a regular basis. Yeah. And that's before such a big project. So let alone when a big project comes on board. I, I just, I felt like I did not get any of that data. Mm -hmm. Are you going to add? To yeah, I just, I went through the whole thing quite carefully. And <clears throat> tell me if I'm wrong here, but it looks like the current traffic was surveyed once October 29th, 2013 for one day. And that the entire current traffic is based on that one data point. Is, is that correct? That was the data that we, uh, the data that was referenced there yeah. was collected under another project. The data collection that we will use for our data analysis here has yet to be collected okay. because we just, want the same data. But since it was available at the Yeah, no, no, but just, it, it says we get 16 cars coming into our lot at rush hour. <laughs> if you've ever sat in our lot uh, in the summer, 16 is so far from reality. I mean, you can't even move in there. People are being turned away. It's, you can't park, period. So it really throws all the rest of the data into a very squishy light when something is just so clearly not true. And we'll have another data collection. Yeah, no, no, but just, but like, when you're wondering why people are confused, um, when you say that 16 cars are all that try to park in our lot on a summer evening, it, it's hard, and then you and know, I went through all the daily collection routines that, you know, if it's a hotel and it has this many rooms, you get this many cars and this many trips, and if that's the data you use to figure out how to keep Atlantic City near South Station running smoothly, the whole process is not very trustworthy from our point of view. Um, okay. When you look at the standard traffic, analysis looks at peak one hour. So that's 16 vehicles that you're talking about. And then I think you're talking about the vehicles coming in or out of the service parking lot. So, yeah, that's it. So that's over the course of the peak hour. That's one hour. So it's not over the course of the evening. Yeah, but I, I bet there's 200. 16 yeah. is so a lot. I yeah. four or five on one. And that's why, that's why we get an independent count. We have an independent counter go oh, out. Wow. And watch those conditions. And, and maybe it shouldn't be October 29th yes, on a right. Tuesday. <laughs> you know, maybe it should be in August on a Saturday. Right. Um, so right. If I just think about, if we just kind of round out yeah. something you had mentioned. Um, you know, what I was thinking about in terms of the different components of the project getting together, you know, summing all those up. In the report, there was a technical appendix, and there's a detailed spreadsheet, which I'm certainly not going to go over now. But it's something that we can get into. And it's got those different components in it that all together sum up to get to the number of trips that we're talking about during the peak hour of traffic. I, I appreciate that, but I think to um, Chris's point, that again, if it's not recent, then it doesn't feel <coughs> accurate. And uh, my question to you is, are you going to follow the same, are you going to pick one day and then just test that one day and use that as the basis of your analysis? Or are you going to actually pick several days and then look at the differentiation and variability and then uh, you know, base your analysis on that? So the standard process is to pick a typical day, which is a Tuesday for a Wednesday, in a time period, <laughs> or like Tuesday through Thursday. Oh, and, not, not <laughs> and that's what we base our analysis on because it, it is a standard. It's to represent average conditions. Um, so yes, the plan would be to one day of data collection. Um, how do you account for it? And there are just so many variables with this project. It, you know, if this was like. If, if this was like in the financial district where you're putting some big project there, it's nine to five, not very residential area, 
I can understand that type of methodology, but how do you account for so much variability in travel patterns across a week when there's so much, so many different events that you plan to happen in this little particular area alone? Um, I'm still struggling with this. Okay. A couple points. Um, in addition to that one day worth of data that we would collect at the different intersections, we also have what's called two count data, and I'm sure you all have driven over these. They are on the street, and those count traffic um, continuously over a longer period. And we do have one, um, at least one data point for, for a two count for one week from, I believe, last year. It's something we could again do and repeat it. And that gives you, that shows you the variation not only over each day of the week, but it also shows you hourly. And it'll point out those peaks, that AM peak hour and that PM peak hour, where the traffic is at its highest. Um, and just kind of backtracking the point, you were talking about how the anal how can we base the analysis on counts that were 16. The, that spreadsheet I pointed out, that's not using the existing data to forecast into a few into the future. It uses standard trip generation rates for new developments. So for hotel, restaurant, office, if you were in the financial district, for example. So there's a very set process we go to in that group, and I'd be happy to explain it. But I just wanted you to understand that the number of trips we're projecting is not based on the existing traffic accounts. There's do you ever, I am. And, yes. and now, do you ever go back, and this may not be your job, so you can let me know, but whoever is dealing with the standard, do they ever go back and test the standard to see if that's, if, if it's even credible? Yes, yes. So uh, Don had mentioned the ITE rates. ITE stands for the Institute of Transportation Engineers. So there are two very big volumes that we use and we need to use the, to follow the Boston Transportation Department methodology of looking at studying the you know, projects. Um, they have rates in there, trip rates. How much traffic does something generate? And those are based all on observations. Um, and there have been certainly times here in Boston where we do go back and observe how many trips are being generated. And you'd be surprised how close they can be the number in terms of person trips. Very Certainly there's a variation how many people are walking, how many people are in transit, how many people are driving. And not those things all factor into the number of vehicle trips that we estimate. But again, it's part of the detail of the process, which we'll be happy to. Just to, oh, sorry, we're I don't want to, I have something to add that you're finished. Okay, just one point to clarify. There are two issues here, if I'm hearing you correctly. One is the counts of the traffic that's there today. Are these accurate counts? Will they take on the right day? Are they realistic? Do they really capture what's happening today? The second issue is what's being counted. And just to, to add a little gloss what was said, there, this Institute of Transportation Engineer reference series is used by planners, highway engineers, folks like that all across the country. It's based on the tremendous amount of data that's been gathered all across America for how many trips a retail store sees during the day, a drive-through bank, how many people drive through that bank, uh, your typical residential sub subdivision, how many people drive out and drive back, how many people drive up to a hotel, how many people walk to a hotel. There are these sort of mode shares that are calculated around the country. The numbers, believe it or not, tend to be a little higher than Boston numbers because most of this country drives more than we do in Boston. Our transit doesn't work particularly as well as we'd like it to here, but we do have transit. It is a more walkable city than most. But the IT numbers are based on national averages of all these data that are captured. So there are two pieces here. So it's, it's, it's up to us to put data together with folks will find credible about existing traffic in the area. The second issue is they are just sort of cut and dry numbers that come out of tables. If you add this many square feet of restaurant across America, you're going to see this many cars drive up and drive away during the day. So there are really two elements here. We hope to present that with a little more context when we add detail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So when, well, have a question. Well, can I add one more thing quickly? When you guys do that, what I'm trying to get to, the data is only as important as the mitigation and the, the response to the data, right? What I'm struggling with is we can get the data clearly, we can understand a lot more how, uh, we can assess better how you're actually addressing the traffic issue. And right now, I'm not seeing how you all are addressing the traffic issue. So hopefully in that next study, you not only show more detailed analysis, but then really thoughtful thinking around how you're actually addressing the traffic problem. Your comments are very clear, and we will do our best. Can I ask a question on this for ten of us? Uh, will you also be addressing the fact that there will be 300, uh, 300 person ballroom, I believe, the weddings, maybe two, three a week, and the traffic that that will bring in and out? We'll, we'll the 150 happy. room restaurant and, and the bar? Yes. Yes. And not just on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we'll not be looking at this on a proper basis over you know, over several days, maybe even weeks. We, we need to see that kind of data. We will, we will address all the use components here. You referenced the... And the employees of the hotel and, and, the, and, and the, all the vendor coming in, vendors coming in, trash and everything else. You referenced the land use codes that the hotel and quality restaurant between place four listed. You had a, another appendix. Oh. Uh, what's the number of that appendix? Um, <coughs> sorry, I was looking to compile the report. Let me... So it's Appendix B, and it's entitled Generation Worksheets. And that was the. Oh, it's included here. I'm, I'm sorry, I hadn't realized that it was part of this document, but it was a separate document. Okay. And that was include more detail than this page. Yes, so just. As well. Just to show everyone who's got a copy of the report, it looks it's a very small print table that looks like this. So Liz, walk so, us through how to read this. Can I just ask, yeah, well, so the hotel, when you just said when you spoke three times the hotel, that includes the ballroom, the spa, everything else in that one category of hotel? Within the hotel, yes. This. So if everyone has that open to that table, yeah. um, I wish I had a slide that showed it. But What's the page number, please? Sorry. It's a page. Thank you. But it's the second page number. Okay. Okay. So there are two there are two pages. It's it's double sided. Double One side. says existing conditions, and then the back side of that has much more data on it and says the proposed program. So just to orient us a little bit, it broke it up into different time periods. Daily conditions are at the top. AM peak hour is in the middle, and the PM peak hour is on the bottom. Across, or if you look at the first column, down the column you'll see different land uses. Hotel, arena, restaurant, the event space, and a drinking place, which is the name that uh, ITU gives to a bar. Drinking place. The next column says size. So that's the size of the use in measurements that we need for <coughs> ITE. So the hotel says 277 units. Marina, 55 new berths, and I would point out this is new space. The restaurant, hotel, the event size, and the drinking place of 3,800 square foot. What does it take? I'm sorry to take the past how many seats would be there. And we could do that. We can certainly figure that out. The measurement for ITE is the square okay. footage. So then the next column with numbers, so the next column says category total in out. So that means in, the in trips plus the out trips equals the total here. The next column shows trip rates. So if we look at the hotel on a daily basis, ITE tells us that there are 8.17 vehicle trips per room. 
8.17 vehicle trips per room per day. And that's the ITE standard. That, and just to say that BTD will look, Boston Transportation Department, will look and make sure we're using that right, correct rate. So we can't change that rate. Um, and you'll see below it, the, splitting it out into ins and outs, 4.09, in and out. We then calculate something called unadjusted vehicle trips. That would be if this hotel were located in Iowa, where there was no transit and no opportunity to walk anywhere. So that hotel would generate about 2,300 <coughs> vehicle trips on a daily basis, if it were in Iowa. We then do an adjustment on what's called internal trips, and internal trip capture. That, if you have a mixed use project as we have here, you'll see some synergies between the hotel and the restaurant. Um, that's the 25% <coughs> adjustment you see under trip capture. Again, that's a standard rate from IT. It's not something we make up. It was just to be clear, that means that some of the people in the restaurant will be hotel guests as opposed to driving them separately. Am I getting You are, but that's correct. 25% of the restaurant. <laughs> Right, so they, they wouldn't be coming separately. They would be staying at the hotel, they go to the restaurant for dinner, and then go back to their room. So that accounts for that. Um, we then do the math so that we end up with a column that says less internal trips. Now, these are vehicle trips, but because we're in Boston, as John very eloquently explained, we've got transit trips, we've got walk trips. We want to understand how many person trips those 2,200 vehicle trips are <coughs> So the next column says assumed national vehicle occupancy rate. That, those rates are 2.2 people per car. And again, based on um, observed occupancy of vehicles. We then get to person trips. So those 2,200 vehicle trips are now representing about 4,900 person trips. We then take those person trips and say, okay, we're in Boston. How many of them are going to be on transit? How many will be walking? How many will be in a vehicle? And these transit share column that you see, the 15%, 7%, four of those, there are different rates for different land uses. Those again come from the Boston Transportation Department for this particular neighborhood. So depending on where the project is, those rates, those mode share rates will change. So a project in downtown on Franklin Street would have a different transit mode share than what we're showing here. So the transit mode shares, 15, about 15% walk, bike, other, hovering around 54%, and the vehicle share is about 31%, although much higher for that corporate event that would occur during the day. So let's what this could mean is someone might drive to the hotel, walk out to see the neighborhood, walk back, drive away later on. These are some people will, will arrive without a car at all. Some people will use a car partially during their time. Some people will get in the car every time they want to go anywhere. Correct. But the average is the splits that you went through. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Just uh, one, one more thing. So to sum up, uh, we're trying to get a more credible current condition survey. We'd like to understand a little bit more about the um, uh, way you're calculating everything, which you just did a nice walkthrough. The only thing we're missing here, which I think is the single most important part, is how long does that mean the cars are in the street for? So if you have a 1,000 vehicle trips a day, but you've got a five-lane highway, it really doesn't matter. But if you have traffic lights spaced every 20 feet apart in only one lane, that's a really ugly thing. So the, the thing that's not here at all, and which I think we'd really like to see, is on average it takes this long to drive from here to there, and after this is over, it's going to take that long to drive from here to there. Right, and, and I would just reiterate that again, this was, this is a PMC. No, no, I, I hear you, but like in, in, in terms of, if we want to recommend something like we need oh. another highway or oh, no, we need no. another light post here, you can't do it without knowing what the effect is. Absolutely. And that's the real part of my job, which hasn't happened yet, really. <laughs> um, 
and just to finish off my column because yeah. I just want to close it, close out the column, but then I'll pick up on that point. So we end up with vehicle person trips in the third column from the right, and then we reconvert those vehicle person trips back into vehicles, right? 2.2 people per car, and then we end up in the far right column with the number of new vehicle trips. So those are the volumes that ultimately feed into what's called intersection level of service analysis, which is gets at exactly what you're raising. Where are they? Where are they going? Which would be very astute to point out that that trip distribution map that we have, that's where those trips will be assigned. And we will see how many new vehicle trips get added to the intersections. And then we do an analysis of that. And the analysis tells you average delay per vehicle, how long is a driver sitting there, and what that feels like in terms of what's called level of service. And it's level of service A through F. And that analysis just has not been done as a normal course of the project at this point. But we will certainly get there. Can I ask you a Sure. Where's the um, banquet hall in this analysis? So, is that part of the hotel analysis? So, within the hotel <coughs> land use, Sorry. within the hotel land use, there is a certain assumed <coughs> amount of banquet space and activity that goes on. However, here we added in down in the fourth row that hotel event. So we said, we said, okay, we need to really account for something that's happening on a weekday because, again, our typical chart is to look at the morning peak hour on a weekday and the p.m. peak hour on a weekday. And that's what this scenario is showing. <laughs> I mean, I assume if you're going to travel, you check in by, you check out by 11, you check in by 2, 3 o'clock. Is that where, is that including the formula? So that's the period of time, or is it? <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? I do. When I travel, that was the time I'm on tour from a hotel, yeah. usually. Is and that part of that formula? It is. Um, so it's not all day. And, and I focused, when I was chatting here, I was focused on the daily, which is, we're talking about the 8.17 mm -hmm. trips. But if as you move down the chart, it, the AM peak hour, which is under this bar, yeah. that that trip rate becomes 0.53 trips per room during okay. the morning peak hour. Yeah. So if you think about it in terms of being in Iowa, again, because those are the, the rates before they're adjusted for transit, that's one vehicle trip for every two rooms in a hotel during the morning peak hour. And I think the PM, PM is a little higher, but similar. So that's where it accounts for that variation throughout the day. Yes. I just had a quick add-on on the traffic. Um, and I have some other comments, but I can wait my turn for those. Um, is anyone going to look at or come and look at a weekend? Because I think the daytime, like weekday, morning, and afternoon, isn't really uh, everyone joined in. But that's not really my concern. My concern would more be on the weekends in this neighborhood tend to be very crowded with tourists and people come in to dinner at all the restaurants and everything, that's when you really have the absolute gridlock. That's where you hear the stories about people, you know, ambulances not being able to get through or fire trucks or whatever, when the street is completely jammed both ways, no one can move, and then you have a wedding with however many people that generates however many cars, plus the restaurant, plus the bar, all happening at once on a weekend in the summer. What is that going to look like? Is there a way to capture that? Is there a way to analyze that? And then my second question is to Chris on the traffic. At what point in the process of this whole thing does that data come, and how does it get digested by everybody? Well, I think the feedback we've heard so far is great. It's what we hope that you would all dive into the PNN and we would have this uh, more thorough dialogue. So again, everything I hear tonight, I can bring back, talk to our senior staff, and we can very well, very well may be asking them to produce this extra analysis as quickly as we can get it to the IAG, we will. Uh, and like I said, <laughs> and like and I said, Jen, next steps. Over, like, how do you measure that? <laughs> Summer's, now it's like 50 and raining out. <laughs> um, we're obviously going to take that into consideration. But, but I, I hear you guys loud and clear, and this is good. 
thorough feedback, and you've all done your research, and we appreciate that you've done that. So. Well, they have the existing road conditions. Let's reset some. We did a couple of locations. We don't have everywhere, everywhere that we might ultimately end up studying. Before we do have some data from this summer. Yes. From this past summer? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not, it's not unusual for us to take one or two data points that exist in the summer and apply a factor to the counts that we need to mimic those conditions. Traffic, give us a map. Sorry, I can't go back and set up. That shows the full detail of what you study. Oh, there is a figure that is called study area intersections. There are four that are identified. I believe we heard quite clearly the last time. Yeah, um, that's why I wasn't I saw this when you know, like, no, that's that's why I'm asking the um, So I think at a minimum the intersection of cross at Atlantic at Mercantile. And then also purchase as well. That little spot where there's also Oh, the other side of Mercantile. Yeah, exactly. Mercantile is that little segment between. Yeah, there's like six or eight miles that you can stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yeah. And anyone's bring up like a bike lane? The bike lane is a bike lane. That's true. We don't have anything to do with it. I do know something about the project that will be ongoing out there. Yeah, right. I have a question about the traffic. Actually, two questions. Um, first of all, when you do your traffic analysis in this project, will you be taking into consideration um, the buildings that are in progress in construction, the buildings that are approved and haven't even started yet, um, all the buildings at the North Station area, all the buildings at the Seaport area, that when those buildings are completed and when they're occupied will add all that more traffic, mm -hmm. number one. And number two, um, the gentleman here just uh, mentioned the raised bike paths that are coming. Mm -hmm. um, and some people have said, well, it won't be any different because we already have bike paths. Well, the difference is now in reality, people drive in the bike paths. They pull over in the bike paths. When the Connect Historic Boston bike paths are completed, those will be raised, and what we what we are supposed to be doing now will be enforced because there is no more room. So that will be a burden. I, the only thing I can see that would help us is that uh, the snow can be dumped on those bike paths in the winter. <laughs> you know, I mean, because they won't be used that much in the winter. So, but I think you know those things. You know what you are looking at here is great, but you need to take into into consideration what it's going to be like then. And it's not now, but it will be. These things are approved, these things are coming. Yes. And again, it's part of our standard process to choose a design year, again, by the city guidelines, that looks five years into the future. So we would be looking at condition of 2020, and absolutely as part of that, we add in traffic from all those other projects. And I- There's a lot. There's a lot. I mean, I. Not in just not in this report because, as I said, we weren't there yet. Um, but other um, projects that we're working on downtown, you know, we have 15 or 20 projects that we're including the traffic. In. So those get folded into the ultimate analysis that we show. As part of your study, you don't come up with any sort of resolutions to any issue that might arise. They become, you don't just come up with any kind of ideas. <coughs> Oh, so to solve some traffic yeah, problem? Oh, sure. Do you? Sure, oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Elevated highway. Thank you, Liz. I think we've got some homework to consider in this piece. Uh, this is good. Enough, so. If there are no more traffic and parking, we can move on. I have other stuff to move on to. If everyone's done with traffic and parking, let's hear. Okay. Um, first of all, I just want to say I'm not going to repeat any of the stuff I've said in the past, but I do stand by my comments and reference them on the video if anybody wants to. Um, I just stand by those points, like I said. Um, so the questions I have for tonight are, um, as far as the building height goes, um, what I'd really like to see is actual measurements 
um, on a diagram of, you know, the 55 feet that we're talking about on top of X base elevation plus the mechanicals and whatever roof deck and all that stuff against the existing buildings. Um, just so that people can have a true, you know, a real sense of what that means. Because um, I think it's kind of, it's hard to conceptualize when, you know, you're, we're talking about numbers of feet, but just like actually seeing it, you know, drawn out on a map so that people can understand. This is the 55 feet we're talking about, but you have 20 feet under it and you have 10 feet on top of it. And the whole thing is X. 55 feet is this, the whole thing is X. So just kind of like showing the reality of it instead of just keying in on the 55 feet number, which is a kind of a subsection of that. So I would appreciate seeing that. Um, if, if you'll permit me, two weeks ago we asked for a model that would yeah. show elevations. And we asked the architect, have you constructed any models yet? Um, we've been doing it's a yes or no. No, we've not. No, you models. have not constructed. We've done three-dimensional models on the computer, uh, which we've been using, which are models of sorts because they are dimensionally accurate. Um, and we've used both information that we get from the VRA off their three-dimensional computer models and uh, you know, ours. So we well, nice the IAG to see that. Or I think the best thing might be if you've got the model of the VRA, <coughs> you fill in the buildings into that large model in the model. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah. yeah. What's the scale on that? So 1 to 40. Yeah. 1 to 40. All right. If you'd like to see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 I'm sorry. Just, just in response to her comment before we move on. Well, one thing you might want to address, there seems to be um, questions about what elevation 20 means and whether the building is going to be sort of 20 feet above the street and then 55 feet from that. Right. You know, the, how elevation works may not be clear to folks. Yeah, it's fair. Um, uh, essentially, all the grade around the Lewis Wharf building is around 17 to 18 feet. And the new FEMA maps are going to require that we base the base elevation at 20, 24, 6 feet. Okay. So when you're looking at the base elevation here of the building, that's at 20, 24, 6 feet. Whereas I'm not sure at base elevation commercial, I'm pretty sure Lewis is closer to 18 or so. Um, and well, 18 above what? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh, what does 18 mean? It sounds like it's 18 feet above the side. You explain it better, please. Who <laughs> would JB uh, take this one on? So, I'll let you handle that. I mean, Boston City Base, it's, it's, it's a datum point that they've set up based on the tides. Everything in Boston is zero, right? It's a local, it's a local sea level. Local datum, which is not the street level. Right. So, um, you know, Atlantic Avenue is 16 Boston City Base, um, and uh, as it leads out um, around the port, it's about 16 Boston City Base. That's 16 feet above a zero point, which is measured off of. Uh, in the <laughs> yes, so the, the roof line is all at 55 feet. These are the roof terraces you see in the, the, the terrace work, and then behind it are the mechanicals. Generally, the mechanicals and the roof over are 12 to 15 feet. So it's fair to say our building, 55 feet, is measured from a point a little bit higher than the adjacent Lewis Ward mm -hmm. building. Not much higher, but it will be higher. And from that point, it will be, from, from basically as you walk next to the building, it will be 55 feet up from there. There are mechanicals above that that are not counted building height. However, there may be a misconception because we mentioned this. This is not like a biotech building. It's got big scrubbers and great big exhaust structures on the roof that effectively make the building two or three stories high all the way around. These are set back around the center of the roof, quite hard to see from the ground. Perception of this building, we roughly like walking down the street from the south end. It'll be about as high as a south end townhouse, which is about 55 feet. Okay, I get, I get what you're saying, because I actually finance real estate development, development as a living, so mm -hmm. yep. I get it, but when you're speaking to the public and when you're showing pretty pictures to the public, I want some reality injected there so that the everyday folks who are looking at this and considering 
whether this needs to happen in our neighborhood can see the actual height, like just chart it out. So these so round rooms are to scale. And this is the actual scale of the 55 foot building with the adjacent buildings. And well, we're about 10 feet shorter than the existing granite building? Correct. Okay, um, so my, my next question is kind of building on that. Um, as part of the public presentation, um, I also just want to ask that the whole project is talked about on the same level. So you're talking about a 277 room luxury hotel, which sounds fairly innocuous when you say it just like that. But when you, you know, add on the rest of it with the same emphasis because it's all just as real. It's the hotel, it's the banquet space, that holds however many people on a given weekend for whatever kind of event. Then you have the restaurant space that holds this many people. You have the rooftop bar that could hold this many people that's open until this time. Those things didn't come out in the presentations, in the past presentations, until we asked about them. Well, actually, we showed the um, floor plans of the building. Oh, I know every you showed time, it, but like. And we walked through it, and we showed where like the ballroom that. was, where the <coughs> restaurant was, where the breakout meeting rooms were. It's so we showed all that. It said that we didn't know about there. rooftop uh, yeah. activity until yeah. Cheryl Del Branco started yeah. to ask for. We've well, showed it every time we heard it, and it, that these are going to be roof terraces up here. We've showed it every time. Okay, so anyways, in the moment, what I'm hearing, we will. Just so. talk about it. Just yeah. talk about it. Like, so that yeah, there. absolutely. Maybe we could articulate the program and how it's going to work going forward, and we'll see some more specific measures. Please. Okay. okay. And okay. then, yeah. um, on the pavilion, kind of in the same spirit, the presentation was made that that pavilion space is true public space. Anyone can use it. Makes it sound really nice, you know, for the neighborhood to You're just talking be able about to the, this space here? Yep. Be able to hang out there. Mm -hmm. But from my experience, when you go to a luxury hotel in the lobby, you can't just like go hang out. Like for <laughs> uh, uh, uh. moms with the kids and everybody else. I don't really think I mean and tell me if I'm wrong, but when you talk about that, is that really true? I mean, <laughs> that's how we intend to program it. So yes, it is. Okay. Uh, you've ever used the Intercontinental Hotel? I mean, that that lobby there is great. But I've walked through there all the time. Yeah, I, I yeah, we do spend time there, water. but I have to tell you, it's not. I mean, you can't just go hang out. Like yeah. there isn't a luxury hotel in the world that's just going to let every public person, mm -hmm. no matter what their, you know, condition sure, and absolutely, and I can see the development. So you're going to let that the public people public. come and. <laughs> well, just kidding. no, there's not going to be homeless people. No, so but like, be real about that too. I'm just at, like, yeah. be this real. is a fully publicly accessible space for everyone in the community to come and use it if you so choose. If you imagine a rose fort arch that were glassed in, that had doors like revolving doors, the, the, the goal here is the same way you can walk that arch and get to the water 24 hours a day. That's the goal here. But is it the hotel lobby? Well, the Marriott on water. The lobby entrance here, which is coming off here, and then it flows into the connector. So the, you're, you're thinking of a reception desk where I walk into a hotel and there's someone that meets you, meets you. That will be in this <laughs> entry lobby area, small. And then the idea is that flows out into a fully accessible public. Okay, and then the last, um, the last two points I have are for Chris. Um, so I think you know we people have said this in various forms, but just to just as an example, the Haymarket Hotel is already approved that has over 200 rooms, or it's in in process, right? Yeah. Um, the Garbley parcel B and C by North Station, that's in process or approved. Uh, that, I don't know how far along it is, that's not my question. So those are each two, over 200 rooms, very close by to this. Um, and those are just two out of 23 projects that are currently underway in the city hotel projects that are producing 4,700 either new or renovated hotel rooms. So is a hotel right here really the best use of the space? 
and I'm, I'm not asking you to answer that question right now, but I just want to kind of put it out there. Okay. Um, when you have reports showing that more hotels are needed near the convention center, you know, kind of, I think when the hotels around Boston are full, because we do have that issue with like my work, people coming in and stuff, it's because there's a convention, a convention center, and there's not enough hotels over there, and they come and take over the city hotel rooms. So hotel rooms are needed, but it's just my, my kind of thought process is where are they needed and why? And does it really make sense to put 277 rooms right here? Maybe, you know, something more creative could be done with the site. Um, and my last point is kind of on the same point, is, you know, as a neighborhood and, and the BRA, as the city of Boston, do we need to accept this proposal for Lewis Wharf to create change and improvement for the area, which clearly everybody wants. I'm not into development, I don't think a lot of people in this room are, but do we need to <coughs> say yes to this to create that change, or is there something better? Like I said, we're still in the process of adding that, but I appreciate the question. Thanks. Um, I just had some general comments, I guess, and questions. Um, the first, if we could go back to the slide that shows the existing condition. And I just want to... <laughs> there, oh, that one? Or the yeah. one with the... Uh... This one right here? Okay. Just to... One of the... I mean, I'm, I'm worried of putting a big hotel in a residential neighborhood. I'm kind of against that concept. So given that, my next question is what are the benefits for us of the big hotel being here? And obviously a park would be the benefits. And I look at this slide and I see a lot of parks. And the entire south side of the building is green on the entire side. And there's a big swath of it that's green on the north side. And that swimming pool where it is right there, is going to be halfway down right in the middle of the grass on the south side when the hotel comes in because it's going to push the swimming pool down. So that swimming pool is going to have a fence around it and it's going to take away a lot of the public space there. So it's actually, you shouldn't be including that in your park that's being created it's not, yeah. in terms of the net benefits. It's not good. And the, you know, I, I used to take tours on the waterfront with Vivian Lee. I don't know if you remember her. Um, <laughs> It was her favorite place in all of Boston water because it's beautiful and it's restful and you can sit there. And so I, I'm nervous when you say we're going to tear it up and put a pool that's kind of in the middle of it. Just And then on the other side, there is a big park there. And I can tell you people walk their dogs there in the morning. I know it's right outside my window. And there's a lot of activity there, um, as well as all on the end of the pilot house. It's quite park-like if you go out there. Um, when the hotel comes in, a lot of that green swath is going to disappear, and you're going to move it um, towards the street where there's currently a big open, open park lot. So you're not going to be, we'll probably be creating a little bit more green space on the north side. It's so, almost a double amount of green space. Um, so it could be. It's just about 25% more. <clears throat> Whatever. I'll just go through this with you. Looking at it, the benefits park-wise aren't huge relative to the giant sort of wall that I think is going to be put there. Um, obviously, you know, I can't see exactly how it's all going to look. So I'm, I'm a little bit worried about um, what the, the benefits are at, and it's done. Uh, the downside is obviously the traffic um, and uh, perhaps losing a little bit of the waterfront continuity and everything that goes along with putting a hotel in a residential neighborhood where there isn't one right now. Um, and the only thing I guess I'd say is with all the other things coming in all around the north end that we've all talked about, and Chris, uh, I apologize to you, this has not been for you, but two days ago in the uh, Boston Globe, they had a uh, article, and the, head, the current head of the BRA apologized 50 years late for tearing down the West End. Yeah. And I don't know if we're going to have to wait 50 years to be apologized for everything that's happening in the North End right now. So I'm, I'm just a little worried about it, and that's kind of a comment. I know that's a little unfair, but uh, um, I just don't see the big benefit that this project is going to do, and the massing of it is the problem. And the massing of it is because it costs so much to get the land, and perhaps sinking that part. Um, and I don't know if there's some way we can affect that, but um, the massing of it, to me, is the problem. And that's what most people in this room are against. Um, and I don't know how we can talk about that, because I think you guys are completely unwilling to go less than 180,000 square feet or whatever it is. Um, so it makes it very difficult to have a conversation about what the right thing is to do. Uh, that's sort of my comment. I just had a general comment to follow up on that. 
Because <coughs> I noted also in the news that the city has indicated a willingness to take concerns of local communities seriously with regard to traffic congestion at the Wynn project, where they're spending enormous sums of money to sue Wynn. So it's good to know that you're doing that, and I hope you'll be doing that kind of thing in this under these circumstances. That's the only comment I really had, because everything else I was going to discuss is Thank you. We got an email from Bud on, on variance mm -hmm. now in Article 25. Now. I'm fairly not well versed in that. So yep. Are you can we to that? that? Yep. Can you, aside from you just saying we are, or you think right. you are, is there, any, is there like a, I guess, a impartial party that says that you are? I don't know. Do not be the impartial party. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll turn that over to Don, I mean, but let me get the answer. Um, Bud's email that you all saw um, addresses Article 25 and that we're not in compliance. Specifically, he calls out uh, Section 5.8. Uh, then he calls out that we're allowed a variance under Article 25, <coughs> Section 6, and that's a, um, what's the word you used on, a prescriptive variance. In other words, there's a checklist that a building meets all these certain, designed with certain criteria, uh, it uh, meets that variance threshold. Um, what was not mentioned in that email is the very next section, section uh, Article 25, Section 6A, uh, which basically says there are exceptions to 25, 5.8, uh, provided that the building, one, is in a Harbor Park plan, which this is, and two, that we're talking about a velocity zone, a piece of water that this is. And the exception is that there's a structural solution for the building construction of the deck, deck, the design of the deck uh, allows essentially for a, uh, what's the word on a letter of? A conditional letter of map revision. By FEMA to reduce this from a V4 zone to an A2 zone. And that is a structural solution uh, to the email that Bud sent out. So our feeling is we are in compliance. We will go through that uh, process with FEMA and get the conditional letter. And again, I again, want to say our, our disclaimer here that this is still under review. Uh, we have not made a, made a determination on zoning compliance yet. We're continuing with that. Inspectional Services is the city department that ultimately give them a building permit. So they, they are the ultimate body that decides if it's as of right. Uh, but our zoning attorneys are continuing to look through this to, to determine that. Well, I would just add to what Will said. The typical zoning variance is an application to violate the zoning code. For example, this is a 55-foot height zone. Say we propose to build a building that's 120 feet high. So you'd seek a variance. You basically seek approval to not comply with the zoning code. Build a building taller than the zoning code allows. Use variances similarly in a residential district. Maybe someone wants to open a restaurant on a corner, and they say, you know, it doesn't it doesn't apply with use regulations but it'll be okay, it'll fit, the neighbors support it. If that approval were granted, that'd be a variance that would allow a violation of the code. And there, there are variances like this that are, that are obtained uh, uh, commonly uh, in Boston as we look at the city as a whole. In this case, this project has been designed to comply with the height regulations, the use regulations, parking regulations to fit the zoning, land use controls for the site. Article 25 is a very different type of regulation. It's not a classic land use control. What it really does is incorporate some building code requirements for flood zones into the zoning code. And there is a provision in Article 25 for variance that's very different from the type of zoning variance folks are familiar with, which is to say that rather than seeking approval to build an 80-foot building in a 55-foot zone, which is basically approval to violate the code, but perhaps under circumstances where the folks can accept that, um, Article 25 sets out a long list of technical standards that have to be met. And if those standards are met, the Board of Appeal is authorized to grant a variance. So if we were to seek a variance, well, that's not our plan, to be clear. If we were to seek a variance, we'd have to engineer this building in such a way that we met a long, quite detailed list of technical standards for safety and flood resiliency that would make it a, a, a safe place to put any kind of occupied structure residence, hotel, etc. Uh, but to Will's point, <clears throat> there is a provision in this article that says 
and if the site is built out in such a way that will attenuate the waves. And this is not inventing anything new here. This is a, uh, there, there's water site construction in every big city and every coastal area in the world, and there's a, there's a great deal of engineering uh, know-how about attenuating waves that you can safely build at the end of the waterfront. Uh, if you do those things, you are eligible for a FEMA letter saying that you're no longer within a flood zone and you, you have, you've attenuated those conditions so they no, no longer apply to this site. If that's the case, you no longer require a variance. There's a, there's a different kind of approval the board can get based on that FEMA acceptance of the design proposal. So our plan is to seek that engineering solution. It's been sought and obtained many times around Boston and many times around the country, and similar approaches have been taken in many other coastal cities. But the, just to be clear, that the, the safety and, and probably all of the important resiliency of this building and a site with, with a, a, a changing climate is something that we've given a lot of thought to. It's not just for the protection of the, the, the residents, and for people in your file, but those are obviously paramount concerns. It's also important to show the folks who will finance the hotel that it's it's a durable investment and it's going to be there uh, 30 years down the road. <coughs> are we going in an order? Or yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm just trying, based upon some of the meetings that we've had, we've had a few, so. I'm just going to kind of say the biggest concerns as far as I see it, and then maybe some mitigating factors to address those that you may consider. I know some of these may be viable, some of them may be not, but I mean, it's just things that I've talked about with people. Um, so clearly, it's the overall size, traffic, noise, and then the impact on the community. Um, I don't know whether, I mean, certainly eliminating, and if we're looking at the screen, that would be the bottom, but it's sort of the south building entirely, and adding a park there. While that may sound very aspirational, I mean that that would go a long way to address some of the concerns about you know if we're talking about where the current park is being the best in the north, and if you can imagine a park extending up to the pier, I think that would replace it quite well. Again, I know the economics of that might not be viable, but I think just thinking like that uh, in terms of the buildings themselves, whether it's lowering their heights, um, maybe it's a tiered structure. So the first 30 feet are a little bit wider than the upper floors, so that maybe the view isn't impacted as much. Um, certainly decreasing the room numbers, maybe not having the building go the length of it going out as far into the pier or into the um, islands there. Um, but just things like that, the dedicated ACL cell lanes maybe would be helpful for traffic concerns. Um, and then certainly, and which has been discussed before. Having reserved parking for both Lewis Wharf and North End residents, I mean, I have a resident sticker. I park on the street. I can drive around for a half an hour and not even think about it. If there's 10 other people like me that could park in there, that would certainly help alleviate some of those concerns. And I think it would go a long way to showing what the hotel is trying to do and how they're trying to, um, you know, work with the community. Um, right, be good neighbors. Um, the noise and things like that, I know there's a lot of outdoor seating and it was discussed that, uh, especially on the south side, which would be facing commercial work. Even if that was a limitator or sound barriers were put in place, um, I mean, to me, if you had just all the outdoor seating between the two buildings and facing the harbor, that would be a lot less noisy than anything else. <coughs> exactly. So eliminating anywhere else except for there. Well, I think I wanted the meeting to discuss that the south side. We'll still have some uh, outdoor seating to the restaurant along here, but that could be to a limited hour and stuff. A limited hour, even, you know, and I don't know if there's any sort of structures, I'm sure there are, that could be built to sort of... Uh, can, can we pause you just on one point? It's a minor point of what you're saying. Yeah. There, there was more programming on the side of commercial work originally, and people pointed out that that, that was going to impact them, and we sort of did one of these. And we did move a lot of the activity into that court. Okay. So, not to suggest we remotely address everyone's concerns, but we're, we are listening and we're, we're trying to incorporate some over here. All right. And then, um, and then just finally, <coughs> again, with the impact of the community, I mean, the Nazaro Center certainly can use some uh, donations uh, <laughs> as well. I mean, you know, we have we have NEMPAC, we have Ruff, we have, and, uh, you know, uh, another, other things like that that are, that, uh, are you know, the restaurants in our community certainly give back, so I just hope that there would be the same sort of uh, commitment to those groups that exist here that you know, many of our children and families take advantage of every day. So that's it. I have a comment. Lance, 
my opinion of this proposal is pretty well known, but I do have a short statement to make. <coughs> it isn't acceptable for a residential neighborhood. There are so many areas of Boston that are truly blighted and made to be rehabilitated. The North End waterfront isn't one of them. I ask the BRA to deny this project quickly and focus your energy where rehabilitation is truly needed. The developer isn't interested in saving residents and visitors from the dilapidated parking lot or the abysmal condition of this portion of Harbor Walk, and they aren't interested in joining the harbor with the neighborhood. In an interview with the NorthEndWaterfront.com newsletter, Will Adams said this, quote, We've heard concerns about noise from abutters, so to limit that, we are thinking that programmed space would be in the water court area. The water court will be the heart and soul of the hotel. Situated on the harbor of the glass, harbor side of the glass lobby connector between the two new buildings, and segregated from the surrounding neighbors, unquote. They will wall off, or as Will says, segregate the harbor from the neighborhood. They'll make it their own, and the harbor will become the heart and soul of the hotel. It's currently the heart and soul of our neighborhood, and we'd like to keep it that way. The developer claims to be interested in hearing the neighborhood's input, yet they continue to ignore our input. They claim to be willing to mitigate or make adjustments to the plan, yet when pressed at the September 10th IAG meeting, the developer admitted that it is not economically feasible to downsize any part of the plan. Their offer to make adjustments is strictly limited to the number and location of trees in their so-called park. I hope the BRA will see this proposal for the unwelcome, inappropriate, and damaging changes it threatens to bring to our neighborhood. Please read the comments by residents to the BRA during this open comment period. And please use thoughtful consideration of the 869 plus signatures on the Save Our North End Waterfront petition when you make your decision to or deny this proposal. monies out there that I know we don't have housing in the North End yeah. so much so though. Is there any monies that we can get out of that and that may towards this project to help um, with other things like mitigating other other avenues that you know, the traffic situations with every large project that gets approved in the city, we put together a community benefits and mitigation package and oftentimes there is a monetary donation to local organizations, whether it's a CDC or whether it's a community center. So that's certainly something that, that can be on the table. That and as we go hope that that stays on the table because that's very you know, something that I would like to see. Yeah, happens. I mean, quite frankly, we haven't had those conversations just yet, but that's that's part of the course for an article in the lunch And if I may just add, just to follow up with John Fredman's comment, is that time I know you did mention donations and this approximately maybe eight to nine hundred thousand that has to go back to the in the Lincoln payment. I mean, certainly not just talking about a donation, but I think seeing this room, this room has plenty of money to, to give you the donation <laughs> yeah, yeah. in the center, but we're talking about the linkage money that's that can exactly go back into the neighborhood. I mean, that would be great if we can get it back into the neighborhood. And as John mentioned, there, there's plenty of programs here, such as this building here, the Zara Center. I mean, there's the NEM path, there's you know, the particular churches we have. I mean, but that's, that's not the that. Sorry. Yes. And that's a push that you guys, we all need to do with the BRA as to how much of that linkage money can stay within the community. Yeah, we, we look for direction from the IAG on that. And if there's jobs created, you know, we, we look for direction on the IAG and try to keep those jobs over the place. Back to the point of sale, is there any limited to how far I can go on the highway, I forget. Yes, yeah, so um, at the end of the pier line here uh, is the 1880 Harbor Line, which we previously addressed. Um, and the building is set back 35 feet for end of pier. Correct. Instead of a moving, it's right. like a pump slope. You know, you're asking, could you Wait, extend? Wait, this is this right? This is the north side, this way. Right. Uh, this is the south, south side. side. This right. is the north side. Yeah. Yeah. So, there's no get rid of that. 
subset of that pot. That's what John said. Like not the whole building. Oh, you mean, oh, get rid of the slip of the pot. Yeah. The extension of the building. Is that what you're saying? Yes. A float? You said it's on the A floating park? Yes. <laughs> Put a floating hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't so. Well, it's something well, you have to do. Can you extend uh, the pier out beyond the 1880 Harbor Line? And put a park instead of a slip. So, well, Jamie, you would know better than I, but I. I <laughs> I think the only it is if it's an extension of the harbor walk. You can you can build out over the water for water dependent uses, yeah. which includes public open space. Okay. You are statutory you'll be sorry, you asked me. You'll be statutorily <laughs> prohibited from building out over the water for non water dependent uses. Yes. Statutorily prohibited. Right. Unless you try to twist around a regulation that you have to try to fit yourself into which you don't fit into. Mm -hmm. well, we but it is. So the answer is no. no. It's no. The answer is yes, no, you yes, build yes, the yes, yes, yes. because that's it's called open. water dependent, okay. basically. Okay. All right. So you think the yeah. Problem. But not the hotel. Oh, yeah. And, but we're talking about. No, I'm not. I'm and I'll, I'll wait until the IAG oh. comments are done before I continue that sentence. Um, how how um, hell bent are you on that if we're top seeds? I mean, to me, it sounds like. It's, it's not a bar. Really it's a terrace that we are able to come and see use, them. and it's wonderful outside space. If you're coming to the hotel, you're on the waterfront of Boston. Again, those are publicly accessible areas. It's rough in the bucket for this entire project. Getting rid of it is a small price for pictures. Would you consider that? Okay. We've had well, I'll say right now we'll consider it, but I'm not excited about it. I think it's a pretty spectacular area that we think is going to work well. And as far as parking space, I know John touched on this. Um, you know, one of the other things I'm thinking about is during winter time, uh, we're always struggling. I pay for additional parking, so but there are other people that, that can't afford to. And is there anything that can be done that maybe get additional parking, like free parking during winter storms when there's a, when there's a, a storm is declared? Um, that, you know, not that residents can get free parking at X amount of storms. Emergency parking for exactly. the 24 hour, 48 hour. Exactly. Yeah, we, absolutely something worth discussing. Absolutely. Yeah. And my last question, and I don't even know if you or if this can even address it. Um, I, I'm thinking about, you know, in the, in the concept of giving back. and. and working with kids my entire life. Um, how do we give back to the youth of this community um, in terms of maybe getting jobs in, in the hotel? Is that, is that a possibility of getting, I don't want to say preferential treatment, but something along those lines? Uh, I think absolutely, and I think you can do preferential treatment to more than kids. We have the Jobs and Community Service Office, and that's these projects. In the past, we've had large projects that we set specific requirements for hiring for that one. So that's something we definitely need. Any other questions from my team members before we open it up to the public? I have some that are kind of specific to uh, driveways and stuff like that, which might not be understood. I don't see where. Uh, Vans delivering uh, parcels or uh, moving vans uh, to the historic building uh, would be able to park for several hours. Uh, where's their drop off and pick up space for people bringing in their groceries, uh, kids coming from school and stuff? Ah, where those spots are. I see. Yeah. Where those trees are, yeah. People do get permits for right. moving right. day, but in groceries, I double pack and I bring my groceries back. So, <laughs> Wouldn't that park like the spot you were talking about before? The, um, yeah, yeah. I think it was coming about the meters. I, I, I thought it was coming about 
I think the next time you draw this up, you've got to show specifically pick up, drop off, moving van space uh, very clearly. That's got to be shown. Right? I mean, people have got to be able to get in and out of their houses. And people have got to be able to move in and out. Yeah, we, 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 we need to see. I want to ask because I do want us to move to the public comment, but I, at some point, and, and maybe Chris, you can help me understand, at some point I do also want to uh, talk about the construction, the construction plan. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, think that, I mean, it's not just about, it's not just about the final product, it's what we're going to have to experience to get to the final product, yeah. and I've got a lot of concerns around that too. So. Um, but I, I feel like the public needs to be able to ask some questions tonight, so I just want to be able to talk about that at some point. Though. It's definitely something that comes on the back end. Obviously, the project needs to get approved to get, to get there. Um, but but it's, it's spoken to a bit here. Yeah, they have to address it, obviously. And BTD has to approve it as far as where construction <laughs> trucks are going to idle, uh, where they're going to set up the stage. So it's something that we put a lot of thought into. But obviously, they would need to get approved before we get into it. So I think we'll have plenty of time to have that discussion. But in every neighborhood in the city, especially a neighborhood that's dense like this, that's an important thing to us. So we'll be sure to have that conversation. Just a, a clarification. That, you know, this was so helpful uh, to understand exactly what you guys are planning. If I read this correctly, the garage is going to be under the north building as opposed to under the parking lot. Is that correct? No. Yeah, it's, it, it is not under the north building. It's basically from it's, here, it, you're a little bit short. under the, just the edge of the north building. So when we do loading, it comes up via elevators uh, into this area. There's a, a back house right area here. Uh, but and then the garage comes this way. The garage is under this area. Okay. All right, so we'll open up to the public. We've got a little over 20 minutes left, and again, we're going to be back here next week, and everyone will have equal opportunity to speak. Well, hi. Uh, my name is Anthony Locchiato. I live on Fulton Street in the North End, and I actually have an office at Lewis Wharf, and I'm raising my family here, and I've been I'm living here for 19 years. So I know the area, and I've tried to keep an open mind through the whole thing, and I'm still doing that. And these, this whole team here was very well prepared and professional, and very nice, and definitely uh, know what they're talking about. But some things don't make sense to me. Now, I don't know everyone by last name, but Chris made some good points about green space. Um, you want the clicker? You can, the, the current, first yeah. if you can show the current, because you know which one. This? All right. Yeah, it doesn't look as pretty as from the or distance, but that. Uh, the one you had is fine. This is an uninterrupted green space. There are already our benches here. Sometimes the kids can kick a soccer ball there. And that's going to be completely lost. And what the green space you're offering is completely fragmented. This pool is going to be closed nine and a half months a year like they are now. Right now, the pool's tucked away, so it doesn't interfere with the public. People who want to lay out by the pool don't have people walking by them all the time. So this is what concerns me. And on this side, as you can see, there's a lot of green space. On this side here, there's already a harbor walk with a lot of seats, and you can have a view going towards Castle Island. Now, if you could, this is what, and you're telling us that you're going to have double the green space. I just don't oh, see it. Oh, I you said double or more. Yeah. Now oh, it's, almost, almost. <coughs> it's almost double. I just don't see it, and what you're giving us is all fragmented. And to me, it calls into question everything, including traffic. And I know something about the traffic, too. Yeah, can we just pause you there? Uh, uh, it's nice to see you again. You and I worked on the matter over a decade ago. Oh, I remember. Happy. I remember. Yeah. It's a pleasure yeah. to see you. Thanks for thanks yeah. for coming out tonight. Nice to see you. Um, this <laughs> shot. I didn't recognize you first. <laughs> uh, this shot. If, if we if we put to the diagram of these conditions, 
your, your comment is that you think we're not getting the numbers right in the open space, and that maybe calls our credibility into question in, in general. This is a better image because you really see how much this site's asphalt. This, the angle before, it's a beautiful sunny day, the grass is deep green, and the, and the building from the prior angle is screening all the asphalt. This is just a more representative image. There's a tremendous amount of asphalt in this site. Most of it's going away, not all of it. And as Chris was saying, this is all the green space, right? If this, is, this can't be changed, this is parking area. And the pool's tucked back here. You're going to take this pool and put it right in the middle of it. So you just have to, this is a loss on this side. And it's a huge loss, and it's hugely fragmented. And on this side, well, it's a new pool. Right? There's nothing nice there's pool. Not, <laughs> not, <laughs> not, <laughs> And on this side, I mean, unless Lewis Moore wants the pool to go away, so that's fault. If you want the pool to go away, don't even there. No. Okay. Another point, could you show that picture where you said you said this is to scale, basically? <coughs> it's of the, um, yeah, yes. All right. I just noticed another uh, point here, and this is just for all of us to see. One thing, why this is nothing like Lewis Wharf and the beautiful arch that invites everybody to the water. I took pictures of the moon through the arch. You can see the water from the street. You cannot see Atlantic Avenue from out here. You know why? Because you're a hotel. He walks up, <laughs> he walks up, and that means Atlantic Avenue you can't see the water. So you walk down to Atlantic Avenue. Now you want to enjoy, and people have made this point, but you want it, and this is what, what I concern me. You want to enjoy this water. You want to enjoy the smell of the ocean. You want to see, the, you know, the views. You might want to see over to Castle Island. You have to be on your property. And that, that's a plain simple fact. And, uh, and you're also blocking off the views for people over here, where they already have beautiful views on the other side of the pilot house. People lay out in the sun. They walk, sometimes they sit on the benches. There are many. Those views are going to be blocked. So it kind of chokes off. And I don't think that point's been made strongly enough. And it, in the green space, the double, it's fragmented. And uh, so I don't think it's an addition. Because even look at your diagram here. You've got a little green space here. But you're also blocking this pavilion blocks. So even walking by somebody who sits in Lewis Wharf can't even see the Starbucks anymore. And if someone walking down the landscape you can't even see this water back there unless they come back into the property. You have a, a ramp going down here. All, it's all fragmented. There's no real, I don't think there's any bonus people get. I'd like to just point out that what I heard at the last meeting was this idea that you can't, that this project is gonna lock off the water. So I went down and walked along the Atlantic um, pretty closely one day, took some pictures. I don't have a view of the water as a pedestrian from Atlantic Avenue. I have a view of parking lots and, and other things. So I, I think that this idea that I keep hearing, it doesn't hold any credibility with me from my experience. I have to come back with you. Come back with you. You come out of the sail loft, you yeah. turn right and you walk along, you have a great view of the water, which will all be lost. You obviously don't look all for next week, yeah. we'll, we'll try to give you that picture, existing picture, and then what this building I looked at it from the reverse view here, I, I, you cannot see the road. From the road, you cannot see the water when your development is in. Yep. Okay. You hear what you're saying? We'll, we'll show you something next week. Let's Thank see you tomorrow. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Eileen Gladstone. I live in Commercial Wharf. Um, Last week or two weeks ago, I commented um, about the noise. And I, I have to comment that after I left the meeting, I was walking home. And it was beautiful, I don't know, Wednesday or Thursday evening. And by the time you got close to commercial walk, you could hear all the noise from tears across the water and across the park. So noise really travels in this neighborhood. So. That's a huge concern. It's a concern for, you know, even though you're going to put stuff in between, but particularly having outdoor space on the south side of this building and also on the rooftop. If we can hear the noise from here, we're going to hear the noise from next door. Um, and also, I, I think it would be really helpful <coughs> for all of us if you guys generated some view corridors like we were just talking about. You know, sitting down from the benches between the sail loft and Lewis Wharf, which people do all the time. Yes. If we could see view corridors 
from that elevation, not you know up above, because it, it looks like you can see it. And also, if you're standing like outside of Starbucks, what's the view corridors that people are going to have? And I think if we could see view corridors that were particularly different, that would be reassuring. And if we had view corridors that actually showed you couldn't really see very far, then that would affirm what people's concerns are. But we okay. need the right perspective. It can't just it can't be from up here to go to the view corridors we're seeing now. We'll, we'll so I think that would be really helpful to the neighborhood if we could understand what this would really look like from a human level. You want to respond to that? Yeah, just respond. And, and I appreciate the comment about the noise. It was the, the it's bad. Like that. And you're right. And you mentioned tears. And, and just I just want to follow up on tears. Now, tears recently went up for approval for a new outdoor rooftop. Yeah. And I remember being here at the North End Water for a neighborhood council meeting. And I, I don't know. Did you, I don't know if anyone here came to oppose it. I'm not sure. Maybe you did. But I don't know if you opposed it. Were you president, maybe the city? I've I, I, I I opposed was. some of the, some of their improvements over the years, maybe right. not the last. Right. One. Well, I just you know right. you mentioned T is in the noise, but they went up for a new new um, <coughs> um, patio, and I know it was on the agenda here, but not the one for neighborhood conference, probably last fall. And I think it was the same day that the original plan for JW Capital, where they had residences. Wrong. It was on the agenda that day. I specifically re remember it. All the abutters leaving, and I was very surprised that no one stayed to address that noise concern. I, I don't, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people did stay, but I, I don't think so. But, but I don't know how you felt. <coughs> what uh, I can speak for commercial work. We've had many conversations with the TIAs about yeah. uh, their expansion. So perhaps it wasn't done here, but it was done in person with them. Right, right, right. But my point isn't was it discussing TIAs. It was just really talking about no, how no, no, noise moves in the neighborhood. But we really have to be cautious. And these are residential so neighborhoods. This is, yeah. you know, this is a residential neighborhood. Okay, I've got two hands. <coughs> yeah. Uh, this one's for Liz. Um, thank you very much for informing us that this is a ultra preliminary analysis that you've done because I shudder to think what Sister Rogers would have done to me if I submitted a methodology <laughs> like that for uh, high school methods. But in seriousness, um, the, the one data point makes an average is really hard to, to take. And I wonder as a consultant, if you um, are tasked with doing an analysis, a traffic analysis for, let's say, a McDonald's or something, if that's a similar methodology. I'll put that on the side. So I would really appreciate seeing a more rigorous methodology, because as we all know, our, uh, our governor certainly has a sharp pencil, and I would expect the VRA does also. And I also think about two other things very quickly. One is um, the variability of pedestrian traffic walking right by the entrance to the parking lot. Now, hopefully they'll, they would still want to make that walk if this project went into effect, but that needs to be taken into account because I drive in every single day and that can stall traffic, the entrance to the parking lot, and therefore initiate backup. Yes. So these are the kind of practical realities that should be included in your analysis. The other thing is it would be very helpful if you provided a standardly sophisticated dynamic model where you have maybe 10 variables and then we could run through or see the impact of a variety of changes in those variables because this could be a big time waster because I assure you there will be a very sophisticated traffic analysis done and we don't want to waste time on this and I think it would it would put yours in bad light if you use methodologies such as one data point creates an average. Uh, I live at Lewis Wharf and um, I also want to just echo what my neighbor at Commercial Wharf was saying. I live on the south side with my husband and not only, we don't get the Tia's noise, but we have the noise directly from the bar at Sail Loft. Uh, and they have made a concerted effort to shut that bar down at 10 p.m. Um, but you also have the folks that are partying on their boats all summer long, even up until last week, or until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And then, I live on the south side, I get the benefit of having your um, uh, recycling truck and garbage truck show up at 3.30, quarter to four, every other day. That is not good neighbors. Um, we this dealt with the construction. First I've heard of this. Well, 
I'm bringing it to your attention. Okay. Hopefully I'm well, cool. we've been there for two years. You should have called us. Well, we tried. We, we, we have. <laughs> we've, I've, I've, I'm best no friends with the city of, of Boston. And whoever the woman is that answers the phone at 3 o'clock in the morning have called the police and what have you. Um, but All I want to echo number. that that is a, a critical point for the folks that are the neighbors, the residents that are part of Lewis Wharf, that are part of the Prince Building, they're part of commercial, a commercial work. Noise is a factor, and that has to be taken into consideration. It's not just in the evening, it's late into the night, it's till 2 o'clock, it's till 4 o'clock. If we're having, you're all thinking about having weddings and parties and Christmas parties and what have you, with 300 guests, that's not going to go away. That's going to amplify the problem more than we're already dealing with right now. We've got about 10 minutes left. We've got time checking the staff here. Yeah, actually, if folks could do me a few minutes and we're just start passing up the sign in sheets. Oh, I, I have a question. Just, yeah, just, just, I have just a question uh, for for uh, my friend, Mr. Adams and, and, and Chris. Um, I, I would. I, I've done a lot of zoning work in, in, in different cities and towns, and I've never seen a presentation that doesn't have the exact dimensions of setback from sidelines, the elevations. Um, and so I'd like to ask, as a very simple matter, if you will provide us with a table which shows flood elevations, baseline of building, grade, height of building versus the baseline, and also it shows the, the, the zoning requirements compared to what your project is. You, you've, you've talked tonight about a, a 17 to 18 foot uh, base elevation. Your, 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 your P and F says it's, it's, it's 16 to 17. Um, you, there are all these numbers floating around. There's nothing we can really look at. I don't know how the BRA can assess whether this complies with zoning or not, because there's, there, there, there really are no numbers. Now, I, I, I would ask you if you will give us a table of showing exactly how this proposal complies with zoning and each section about setback height and give us the dimensions and show us a plan that has actual dimensions on it. Sure. Right. I okay. agree with Jen and I think Ernest hit on that. <clears throat> We're going to develop, ask you to develop some, some further specifics on all the dimensions. Thank you. Jamie? There's all these legal technicalities that are extremely important, especially when they're thrown around as, as of right um, or um, what is the proper setback. There's been no references in this room, to my memory, about the urban renewal plan and how it applies in relation um, to usual zoning. And, and I was going to talk and ask about those things, but I, I just I couldn't believe it, it, that I have to say it, but I have to say it. We're talking about people's lives with FEMA and velocity <clears throat> zones and the kind of flooding impacts and the danger of building a project like this. It, it's zoned by FEMA as a danger zone for a reason. If anyone was here during Hurricane Sandy, we missed by a few hours a pretty hard hit. And I represent marinas and boatyards all over the Commonwealth. And they, they lost everything. I, I'm, we're talking about people in these buildings. And I, I heard a, a good lawyer have to spend, I took two, a page and a half of notes to get to the answer about why a variance wasn't really a variance and how it was going to be authorized to be eligible for a FEMA letter so that no variance is needed. This is about human safety. We and the same thing applies for the you, traffic. Wait, wait. It's about getting an ambulance to people who need it or a fire truck. So you already heard from the neighborhood about how they don't want their neighborhood treated parasitically as a showpiece for other people to come and visit. They want to live there. I'm talking about treating the laws with the respect for what they were intended as safe. Thank you. We, we agree with you, and we would be remiss if we didn't take the safety uh, uh, as a paramount concern here. But I'll just remind you that there's an enormous amount of waterfront and pier and wharf construction in Boston in New York City, in, in San Francisco, and many other coastal cities. We're not inventing any technology here. We're going to be using a very well-established methodology. And we're, you're absolutely right about Hurricane Sandy. The, the world's a changing place, and we are uh, building this building to be forward-looking. So uh, 
I want to just underscore that we share your concerns. I don't think you're going to be building anything. <clears throat> You've heard from this room. There are multiple agencies, multiple requirements that, that need to be fulfilled here, including FEMA, including Chapter 91, including Boston Zoning, and including the urban renewal. And our lawyers are looking at all those things. And I, Chris, I know you know well, and I, I'm sorry, you probably know well also. You can't make a public benefits finding for Commonwealth Thailand, so this is a public benefit, if it's not safe, period. Money can't outweigh that, no matter how many pennies you give to the Nazaro Center. Which they richly deserve. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Monica Kratzman, I live on Lewis Walk. Uh, we spoke on the traffic that is a real concern to me. We spoke about the intersection of Cross Street and Atlantic Avenue, but nobody has really addressed right in front of our building the convergence of Atlantic Avenue, then Commercial Street, the, the, the traffic that flows down from, from, North, uh, from North Street and then Fla uh, uh, Fleet Street, they all come together and they congregate in front, in front of the, the, uh, the lights by the Starbucks building. I, I'm, I'm in front of the building at 8 o'clock every morning and uh, waiting for my taxi, but I see so much traffic in the morning, it's unbelievable. The cars are triple, triple cars right, right up to the, to the street light. In the summer, we have the duck boats unloading in front of us. And that's, an, uh, that's something new that, was, that, that just evolved last summer. And that was very annoying, right in front of our parking, uh, uh, the entrance of our parking lot. And of course, we have, we have a bus stop there. Uh, I think that is very disconcerting. I have no idea. It, with the traffic, the traffic is like this already. Then you go up, I, I mean, I, we drive up toward, toward the other hotel. There, there, is, there is, the hotel has, has a light, and then there's a Hanover Street light, and there is no traffic at all going across or beyond. So, I mean, we have a serious situation with the traffic right in front of our nose. And nobody, and, and, and it is just inconceivable how we, how there can be any traffic going in and out of the parking lot. And then we have four or five cars parked right along along the street where, where people hop out and get, get their coffee at Starbucks. Yeah. I mean, this kind of stuff is happening every day in the morning. And the, ta and the traffic, uh, the, the taxi drivers tell me, you have no idea what's happening at night. There's a real nightlife going on and the, and the traffic is unbelievable at nighttime and I have not observed that. But anyway, some of you will, will probably say that this is true. <laughs> and, and this, is a, <laughs> this is, is, is a real, it, it's, it's like, it's like a, a, a whirlwind. I mean, they're coming, the, the cars coming from all directions, and, and that's a real concern. And I, I see no way how, how we can manage having, having the, the, the size, the, the, the numbers that, that, were, that were brought up here, uh, you know, converging into what we already have. So there's something that needs to be done that's very serious. The, the traffic is, is my main concern. We could do one more question. I just wanted to say, don't forget the pedestrians that cause traffic tie-ups. Because those duck boats empty in, because people are walking, they walk and the cars cannot get into the parking lot, into the current parking lot. So when they're trying to get, when we have all that pedestrian traffic, it's just going to make the vehicular traffic much worse. Okay. Promise me super quick. <laughs> Hi, I'm Richard Whiteley. I've lived in the waterfront for 33 years and seen a bunch of changes. I live in Lewis Wharf now. And uh, uh, those of you who partner in Lewis Wharf, have you ever had this situation? You get ready to, for an engagement of some sort, you time it down to the minute, you go outside, get ready to go, and there's five cars lined up ready to get out of the past that seven set of kiosks. Uh, and it, it takes about 20, 25 minutes to get through, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. Uh, and that's a real problem. And I just wonder how we escalate the number of cars that people are going to add, I don't know, extra 127 or whatever it is. How are we going to solve that problem? I, I find myself having to kind of game it, figure out that you can take that additional time just to get out of the parking Okay. We will be back here at 7 o'clock. I just heard um, I'm curious about the legislation that authorized building something.
out there to make an employee or a member of the Is there a reference in the PMF to this, if not in some of the states, one of those things? Which license? Probably well, one of the historical licenses. Yes, yes. Like the 1887 license? Yes. Is it in the PMF? I don't believe it's in the PMF. All right, we'll be back here at 7 o'clock next week. Thank you.